everybody, welcome to the Survival Show podcast, where it's our job to take you step by step through the mindset, skills, tactics, and gear you need to survive almost anything 2020 can throw at you. And it's our mission to increase your survival IQ so you're better prepared at the end of the show than you are right now at the beginning. Mr. Craig and Mr. Gabe, thanks for joining me today. I'm here with Gabe in the studio, and Craig is where? Winchester, Kentucky, heart of all things good. Yeah, guys, it's good to be here, but let's not forget how we pay the bills around here. <laughs> so <laughs> really important stuff. This tiny survival guide obviously has been fantastic for all things survival show podcast. David's MSK one knife, which is shipping. Well, by the hmm, thinking about when we're recording this and when you are hearing it like real soon, soon probably. Soon, yeah. Yeah. Real soon. Probably coming out real soon when you all are hearing this and outdoor core, which I'm a huge fan of right now. Outdoor core is collaboration between Creek Stewart and several different instructors throughout the world, literally. And I'm fortunate to be one of those. David's fortunate to be one of those. Uh, I have a new course up, Vital Survival. So you can go in there. Vital Survival is what I consider to be the vital aspects of survival. I go into uh, personal things, uh, family things, and worldwide concerns. So go check that out. Introductory video there so that you can know what I'm all about. I've got all kinds of videos and the Vital Survival booklet. So check it out. You'll see it in the description below for a link for Outdoor Core Vital Survival. I am excited to check that out. So last time we ran out of time. We've got a lot to cover and it's really important. You all ready to get into this? All right. For everybody listening, last time, again, as David mentioned, we got going really good on several different topics. We we talked uh, pretty well and gave through in some really good headlines from China and the things that are going along those lines from a food geopolitical standpoint and how it's affecting us here in the States. Uh, we got in a discussion about a little bit of politics, maybe. We don't do that very often here. We try to avoid that. But in our current state here in the United States of America, it's just a necessary function because we're getting ready to have this election. So uh, we, we dug into that as it relates to all the things going on COVID, as it relates to the different, what I would consider, and these are not necessarily David and Gabe's words, but what I would consider an insurgency into our country to undermine what it is that our country is trying to do, which is trying to be a fantastic country. So we talked at length about some of those insurgencies and and how they're affecting us both with our friends and how we can communicate effectively with them so that we can overcome some of these things. And one of the aspects that we talked about that I want to highlight again today is united we stand, divided we fall. So the more we can figure out how to work with one another and set aside some of our minimal differences, then we're going to be able to do some fantastic things. And if we don't, then we're going to fall. It's a really good recap, Craig. So in order to be, and the whole point of that was to just make us aware so that we don't normalize 2020. I mean, several of these things have been going on for a while, but, but they've really kind of came to a head. So we need to take responsibility for our own safety and survival. And to do that, we need to do two things to be safer in these uncertain times. One is to reduce our vulnerability to crime and harm. And two is to increase our ability to avoid and repel harm. So here's what we need to do. We need to understand, and this is what this is the, the core of what we're going to discuss today, is we need to understand the criminal mindset. Then we need to develop and nurture a self-defense mindset. And we'll find out what those are. And then we need to master the critical skills of situational awareness and threat assessment. So, Craig, you want to maybe get us started into the criminal mindset? If we can understand our enemy, then we can better understand how we are to prepare for our enemy. So for those people that are out there that want to be uh, aggressors to us. And I, and I like to, when I teach self-defense, I like to divide our aggressors into two or three different categories. That's predator based mindset, which is somebody that knows you, somebody that is seeking you out. Somebody wants to destroy you because they, they find, you know, for females find them attractive or they're upset because you took their job or they see that you have some sort of resources that they want, like a cell phone or a firearm or something. You have the opportunistic 
people that are just looking for resources, not necessarily predator. They don't know you. They are strangers to you, but they're looking for resources. And then the third that I sometimes talk about is assassination. If somebody has it out for you to assassinate you, then there's really not much you can do about that type of aggressor. There's just nothing you can do. If they're going to, if they've determined they want to kill you and you don't know them, then they're probably going to at least get really close to doing that. So the first two, one of the big things that we can do to overcome it is again, understanding these criminals and, and how they're going to approach us. But the big thing is avoidance and awareness. And so awareness includes understanding the criminals are again, opportunistic. They're very selfish. They want what you have. Most criminals we don't know a whole lot about because they're really good at what they do. We hear about the ones that are not so smart. Those are the ones that get caught and go to jail more often than not. There's a lot of criminals that don't because they are good at what it is that they do again. So uh, oftentimes really uh, well accomplished and I use that term, I don't know. I don't even know if I like using that term, well-accomplished criminals. People that are good at crime, I'll put it that way, are typically very organized. They plan what they're going to do. They take the necessary contingencies so that they don't get caught and uh, do everything they can to not allow themselves to be put into jail. Uh, it was really interesting. This I'm going to take this. I hate taking it off off the rails already real quick, but um but it was worthwhile recently. I did a course for some inner city youth that came out of Delaware. I don't think I've told you about this, David, but uh, the Green Beret Foundation contacted me and they wanted me to lead a program for these inner city young men out of uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Highest rate of physical assault or murder or something. I came in, the statistics were mind numbingly just tragic. Um, and these young men were men that that the Green Beret Foundation, if you don't know what the Green Beret Foundation is, you need to look them up. It's one of the, it's not one of, it is the best nonprofit that I've ever worked with in my life. They are really good at what they do uh, out, outside of some of the faith-based nonprofits. But one of the instructors was a lifelong criminal and had been, I mean, he had gone to prison and he had spent like 13 years in federal prison for some things that are not important right now. But, but, uh, the reason they hired him to work with these young men is because he knew how criminals work. He knew how criminals got started. And it was a lot of what I just described. They're very, I mean, he was really good. This is a guy that was making at one point in time, about $3 million a year doing a criminal enterprise. And so he knows how to look at young men that are getting ready to start on the road of criminal activity and then jerk them off the road. <laughs> if that makes sense. So the more that we can get into understanding these opportunistic feeders off of crime or, you know, selfish people and, and they're organized, they don't look like the people that we often see on TV that make really stupid mistakes. Um, that's something to be aware of as far as criminal mindset, if that makes sense. Does that make sense what I'm saying, guys? It does make sense. Yep. In most cases, criminals won't hesitate to use violence against you or your family to accomplish their goal. Would you agree with that? No, uh, I would disagree with that. And that's why I didn't bring that one up. Um, okay. Here, here's why your guy that's not really good at what he's doing. will do that. And so there, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of those people out there, but the guys that are really good criminals know that injuring or killing someone brings attention to whatever it is that they're doing. And so, you know, that's why in a, in a gang, if you've got a leader of a gang and they're moving 14, 15, 16 million dollars of cocaine every year or something of that nature, you know, they they get the new guys to go out there and do their killing if that needs to be done or or that sort of thing. The guys that are way up the chain, they don't do that sort of stuff. They're well organized. They have minions in their army, if you will, to do that sort of task. So, yes, be aware of those guys. Those are the ones that are not necessarily well organized. They've just been given a task and told to go do it. But with that said, as I mentioned earlier, avoidance and awareness are the keys. Have your head on a swell. I mean, we'll get into these, I'm sure. But uh, there's any number of different ways that we need to be cognizant, aware of what's going on around us at all times so that we can be uh, situation aware and what I like to refer to as left of bang. We want to be left of the event and recognize that it's getting ready to happen so that we can address it before it actually becomes the middle of the event. That's good, Craig. So I think we can get into self-defense mindset and kind of contrast that unless, uh, 
It, let me ask you this question. In these troubling times with where we're talking about defunding the police. Or Stupid. For those, di- diverting. Let, let me jump in there real quick. We, we covered defunding <laughs> the police in the last podcast. If you're catching yeah. this one and you didn't listen to the first one, go listen to that. Because we, I think we discuss uh, some really good points about defunding the police, which is just stupid. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just stupid. So it, in these times, what do you think our biggest threat is with regards to criminals? I guess that's it. If the last point here where criminals won't hesitate to use violence against you or, or your family is not the case, do we really need to fear criminals? There you go. Yeah, I mean, here, here's where we are. What, I mean, there's several different questions there, I think, that you just asked. But let me address, I think, what I, is your main point, which is what should we be mostly concerned about right now? And here's what I think we should be mostly concerned about. There's a large segment of our population that have been told that it is okay to be unlawful. And so whether that's rioting and destroying businesses or stealing whatever they might steal. And it, it has nothing to do with any particular race. It's, it's all sorts of races, all sorts of political affiliations. It's, it's any number of different people that are doing these things. They are not being arrested and seized. They're allowed to be able to do these things. And so let's take, for example, what's happened in Seattle and Portland. And because of the media, again, we discussed the media in the last podcast, have just run rampant with just showing these things that these people are doing, then the other members of our society that are disenfranchised with what's going on in their life, whether they're mad at their parents, they're mad at the man, they're, they're mad at the system, they're mad at school or whoever, then it gives them the pat on the back or the encouragement to go, you know, if those people over there can go over there and just destroy a building and take what they want, I can too. And so right now I think it's, that is who we need to be concerned about is that your average ordinary person is all around us. And that person is dangerous right now. And we need to be aware, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier in the first podcast, 525 rule, you know, people getting inside my circle, that are close within arms and reaching me, that's a problem with me right now. Not just because of COVID, but because they've, I, I've never let people inside my circle like that on purpose, unless I knew what they were there for. And even more so now, because people are just running people that would not normally be of a criminal mindset or criminals now and just stealing and robbing and stuff of that nature. And so I think it's worth our while to be cognizant of what's going on around us. In case people missed it, can you just give a little bit more detail on the 525 principle? Well, it's just a, it, it's a principle that's used a lot on a battlefield. It's a principle I teach in self-defense. Uh, think about it as five yards and 25 yards or five meters and 25 meters. It doesn't matter, five feet and 25 feet. You just think about your circle and what is around you. Your immediate threats are always the threats that are closest to you. The things, the people, the you know, the things that are within that five feet from you are the most dangerous because they're close and it's hard for you to react, react quickly enough to any particular threat that might come after you. The ones that are out there at 25 are not as big a threat, but they're still a threat. So no matter where you are, you should always, always be aware of what's within five feet of you always constantly. So if you're going to walk around the corner of a building in the mall, you don't walk within five feet because when you turn the corner, there could be somebody that is right on top of you and there's nothing you can do about it. You want to do it to just be a good citizen. You don't want to bump into people. So you walk around the corner so that you've got plenty of space to see what's going on around it. That's just a simple analogy of what I wanted to try to get across this mindset of five feet around you is uh, very, very important. And then for those that are tactically minded, mindful, I would say that although there's an assessment being made all the time at five feet, there's also an assessment that's being made at 25 feet real quickly thereafter. And so 25 feet is, is still a very close distance for somebody to physically assault you, bring a firearm to bear on you. And if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing, then it's easy for them to pun intended, get the draw on you. You know, and I, I think about this, uh, let me let me point this out too. I mean, if if you're the type of person, or or if you are a person that has a child, 
uh, or you have a spouse and that person is with you and they are not the type of person that has that sort of awareness, then you have to have that awareness as well. You can't have that kid that's running out in front of you 10 feet because you're five, you're five feet in front of them. They're 15 feet away from any threat that might be able to happen. And so um, it, it's something that with spouses or girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever you might have, or uh, family members that you care about, you've got to be aware of their particular aware their particular surroundings as well, uh, because that's a threat for somebody that you care about. Speaking of kids, I feel like that's kind of I don't know the point of what you were getting at on the last the last thing you touched on that the most dangerous people are the common people who are being influenced by with the riots right now. It's like when kids hang out and one kid starts doing something bad, everyone else is like, Oh look, they just got away with it. And that seems to be what's happening right now. I think that's why the risk is so high. You know, the riots are happening in different cities and people are seeing, Oh look, these guys are made being made into heroes by the media and they're not being prosecuted. You know, what can I get away with? And so I think you've definitely nailed on a major threat there. So let's go ahead and start into self-defense mindset. So the first thing I I think people need to do is they just need to determine to be a self-reliant person. And I think getting back to your point, Gabe, and, and your point, Craig, is that you are responsible for yourself, your loved ones, and your property. So last weekend, uh, Gabe for the first time, learned how to shoot a pistol, firearm. It was a really good training uh, America, that son. was put up. That's right. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and I must say, Gabe went from uh, Barney Fife to uh, to Boss Man Gabe. He was nailing it. And I have, man, I have video and clips of the transformation of him on the range uh, with some good instruction. It was fantastic, but uh, we learned a lot about, and I think I think we'll talk about in a future podcast, just uh, our rights and responsibilities with regards to things like firearms and the responsibility that you have for yourself, your loved ones. And uh, I, I don't know if it's like this in the state of Kentucky, Craig, but we have we have certain very specific rights in in the law code uh, with regards to our property, which Actually, some of them were were quite interest quite interesting. Like, if somebody actually takes your property, you have the right to to take it back by any any means possible, which was very interesting. So, anything else on uh, determining to be a self reliant person? I know you're. Ah, uh, I've written books. <laughs> teaching for years on this subject. So, and which and you know you're you talking about David. <laughs> you're. Uh, your company your, is named uh, Nature Reliance. So, uh, you know, there's something about self-reliance and nature reliance there. I think it is important to parse this word reliance. So, yeah. Well, when I wrote the when I wrote my first book, Extreme Women and Survival, there's a chapter in there on self-defense. And I, I go through some things on how people can utilize their own body for self-defense. We talk about shooting pistols and rifles and any number of different uh, weapons of opportunity as well. I kind of got hammered for it, you know, from a few people that like, why is this in a survival book? Well, everybody, welcome to my world now, 2020. Now you understand why survival involves self-defense. You know, we sit and watch these idiots uh, bring harm and maim other humans on the streets in these riots. And now you know why I wanted you to have, why I have a chapter on situational awareness in that book, why I have a chapter on on uh, mindset development, why I have a chapter on self-defense, because that is it. Uh, we're in the middle of it right now. I can't think of a better way for you to be self-reliant than to take responsibility for your self-protection. And one of my cop friends told me a long time ago, and then I've heard it over and over and over and over since then, is that when seconds matter, you know, the police are minutes away. And I don't know very many law enforcement officers, and I train law enforcement officers on local, state, and federal level on a regular basis. They all agree with this. They all agree that everybody should take their self-protection into their own hands. And that when that doesn't work out, and I'm not talking about vigilante justice, 
what I'm talking about is somebody's going to aggress you. You need to be prepared to take care of it. I watched a video last night of one of these riots in, I think it was Portland last night where something was happened. And one of the people that were part of the rioting group got injured and got knocked down and somebody was smacking them around a little bit. And guess who they called for? Police. Somebody called the police. And I wanted to just go through the screen and just lecture this person so hard. You are the same people that are calling for the defunding the police. And as soon as, you know, your crew is hurt, you want to call the police. It's just, it's, it's insane. It's just insanity at its best. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But with that said, self-defense mindset is key. And one of the things that is, that is important with self-defense, what I refer to as surprise, speed, and violence of action. So if you're going to be in a situation where you need to defend yourself, then you need to surprise the person that's bringing, bringing aggression to you. You need to do it quickly and you need to do it with a violence of action that surprises everybody that's around you. Meaning we see these things in the movies where somebody gets hit in the face and they get knocked unconscious. Now, boom, somebody's down. It usually does not look that way at all. People, I mean, it does happen. Don't get me wrong. People get hit once in certain places and they get knocked out. But in most self-defense situations, it's a whole lot more uglier than that. And it's a really ugly if people have self-defense tools or they're using aggression tools like hammers, knives, tools, sticks, guns, any of those things that they get thrown into a situation just make the, the need for surprise, speed, and balance of action uh, that much more important. And part of that, as far as a self-defense mindset, is this. You don't walk around looking like what I refer to as a tactical Timmy. You don't walk around with the with your five eleven britches on, and those are pants for you Canadians. But, um, you don't walk around. We do know what those are. You don't are. walk around in your. <laughs> you don't walk around with five eleven pants on and five eleven shirt, and uh, open carrying a firearm and your tactical Timmy hat and stuff that says you know, um, you know. Well, we'll just leave it up to that. <laughs> And you, you look I'm like prepared to take my gear. Yeah. You'll, you can pry it from my cold dead hands kind of thing. Uh, these are the kind of things that bring attention to you as someone who could have self-defense skills. And that's problematic. You know, we've talked about self-defense. I mean, uh, just awareness and, and being the gray man many times on this podcast, I was behind a minivan yesterday. We've talked, one of the things we've talked about here is you, if you have the little stickers of your family on your minivan, then it tells everybody who is in your family right? There's a mom and a dad and there's three kids. The one that I saw yesterday, I just, I, I almost got out of the car and just scraped it off the van while I was sitting in traffic because it had the two parents. It had the three kids. It had their names above their little figurine or figure. And it had the name of the dog. It told everything you needed to do to steal a kid and rape them. I mean, just, it was just that situation where somebody could come into a stranger and say, these are the types of things that, uh, that they wanted to do, bring harm to somebody. They know everything they need to know. It's, it's just tragic. It's just absolutely tragic. Craig, a little side note. We've been hanging out and doing the podcast a while, and I've trained under you and with you and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm actually taking notes of what you're going to say just before you, you say it. Oh, yeah. So this is good stuff. Okay, yep, cool. it's good stuff. Covered gray man. That's, that's really good. Um, learn how to defend yourself from threats. Practice every day, every day. I kind of threw this word in here. I saw it in some books and some, some articles and things that I was researching for this podcast. Every day, all the time, situational awareness and threat assessment. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Receive proper training. Stop. We got to stop right there. Okay. <laughs> we're not even sitting in this. We're not even sitting in the same room. And I could, I knew you were going to jump in there. Okay. So here's, here's the thing on training you all yeah. is in, and I think another point, if I'm looking at your notes properly is to honestly assess your personal self-defense skills, weaknesses, and fix them. 
you know, one of the, when I took master naturalist certification last year, one of the things that just really stood out to me, for example, I had a, you know, I'd, I would have a soils professor one week, I would have a water professor another week. And then the following week I might have a, you know, forestry professor. And we might ask the forestry professor something about water and they kind of knew about it, but they would say, you need to talk to this person over here. And it was really good to see people that had 20 years of experience and, and PhDs and topics going, you know, I don't know. Talk to this expert over here. If you, and here's how I like to tell people this day, just to simplify it. it let's say you buy a, a firearm. Let's say you buy a pistol for $500. It is my opinion. You need to spend $1,500 minimum learning how to train with that thing. Probably more. You need to spend three times the amount of money of the firearm getting good, qualified training from someone that knows what they're doing. And that ain't Jim Bob down the street that pulls out the dirty, hairy revolver and says, make my day. That's not the guy. You need to vet and find. And if you have to travel, like I've traveled 10 hours to train with certain people because they're that good and bought a hotel room and paid $800 for a two-day class because I wanted to know how to take my sidearm and put it to work so that number one, I don't injure the people that I love and care for. And the people that are trying to injure the people I love and care for, I can uh, do what I need to do. Self-defense with surprise speed and balance of action. And so training, you've got to get the training. That doesn't mean that you can't train on your own, but it's more than just going to a static range and shooting at a target. You've got to move, you've got to shoot on the move. You got to shoot in awkward positions You've got to shoot when your firearm malfunctions, know how to handle that firearm. You got to know how to, you know, if you're wearing a jacket, how to deploy that firearm, if that's what you're utilizing and all that other stuff too. I mean, you got to know how to use your arms, hands, elbows, knees, feet, head. These are the things that you carry with you all the time. And so get training with somebody that knows how to utilize those things to effectiveness to defend themselves as well. Uh, We'll talk about the five weapons you have on you at all times. We've discussed those before, but we'll do a, we'll do a podcast and maybe have you do some demo stuff too. I think we got a video on that on the website, don't we, David? uh, Yeah. You know, we, it is actually, if you, if people go over to the survival show.com in that area down below, you're going to find, you're going to find that and another, another video that, that we did a couple of years ago on that exact topic. And maybe uh, when we talk about that a little bit more in a, in a couple of podcasts, maybe we'll, we'll bring in and we'll, we'll, we'll pull that video in because that's, that's really important so that people always know that they have some means of, of taking responsibility for their, their own self-defense on them at all times. But in, in, question for you, and, and I'm going to preface this with what happened around here, a, f- a friend of mine and I, 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 for those of you that don't know, I have a, I do have a small range close by, so I shoot as much as I can. And a a good friend of mine comes over and we shoot and we were just discussing one day that how many people, like almost everybody we know that, especially who has responded or reacted to all the violence that's going on by buying a personal firearm, but have not been trained how we need, how there's really nothing in our area. And so um, through some proactive means and some friends, uh, we, it, this was the training that Gabe went to with me two weeks ago, which was fantastic, fantastic. It was put on by a, a fella that was a, a career Pennsylvania state trooper. He did 15 years of, of training the, uh, the state police, and now he teaches at, at a local academy. And the folks over there, were overjoyed to do it it was a fantastic training for starting they're more than willing to do level two and a level three training and uh it was it was largely attended by my friend and i and some people that are first responders this first time around and now all of us are recommending that training for those who maybe have some basic firearms training or don't and want to either go to the next level or at least uh, be responsible and get a basic firearms training. Where would you recommend they look to find those sorts of things? There's a lot of good instructors out there, and Gabe brought this up during the last podcast. There's, there's always no matter what field it is, whether it's education or law enforcement or any number of fields. There's, there's bad apples. 
I like to train with people who have uh, experienced things that they teach about. So I like to go with, particularly for me, and this is not for everybody, I like to find a military instructor, somebody who has a military background, particularly somebody that has had been shot at on a regular basis and knows how to respond to that. Because I think particularly for those in self-defense, the big issue is when, when things go off and they start what we call right of bang, then we find ourselves being very reactionary. And what I would like to do is train with people who have been thrust into a position where they have to be reactionary under heaping amounts of life threatening stress and learn how they handled it. Because, you know, the typical person like me, I've never been in military law enforcement, so I don't have a lot of those experiences. And so I want to train with somebody that has, you know, you know, not to be too cliche, cliche, but been there and done that and comes out the other side. And so that would be the first thing. If you find a training organization, then find out what their instructor's backgrounds are. Law enforcement would be my second choice only because of this is that law enforcement typically doesn't see as much uh, serious threat as somebody in a battlefield scenario does. And so that doesn't mean that doesn't detract. That's not a criticism at all. I'm a huge fan of law enforcement. The thing that they can bring to the table that a law enforcement trainer that is now teaching civilians can bring from my perspective is that they have to work inside the law in a way that you're a military combatant does not have to. And so they're really good at being able to handle yourself from a, from a self-defense perspective and also considering the law, which quite frankly is very, very important in our country. So uh, I think anytime you can get with a military law for, or law enforcement person, then it's incredibly invaluable to, to pick their brain. And, and find out how they do things. We kind of went over this. Honestly, you had mentioned this a little bit early, earlier. Honestly, assess your personal self-defense weaknesses and begin to fix them. I'm sure you have a little bit more on that. Yeah, uh, ego plays a huge role in, in most everything that we do. Uh, all humans have it to a degree. And we've got to learn how to control our ego instead of our ego controlling us. You know, a perfect example, just a simplest example is road rage. That's where your ego starts to control you and you do things that you just, you know, most of us don't normally drive right up on somebody or flip somebody off or something of that nature, but you see people doing this in traffic and that's somebody that's allowing ego to guide them and direct them rather than them staying in control of their ego. Um, so that would that would be important to understand that we all have ego and we want to control it so that we don't get caught up in situations that we're not supposed to or we shouldn't be. Um, somebody that was close to me recently, right now, you know, just my observation is that people are stressed right now due to COVID, loss of job. They're scared of COVID. They're not scared of jo- COVID. They hate the politics, whatever. People are just stressed out in general in, in, in everyday society. And I think there are things that you could do today that might upset and set somebody off to bring physical violence against you that would not have even six months ago, for that matter, a year ago, for for sure. Somebody close to me got vocal with somebody that was smoking and blowing smoke on them at a, at somewhere recently. It might be, you know, that's rude and it, you might say something, but in today's world, I just don't think that that's wise because something as simple as that could be the thing that just triggers somebody. And so it would be, uh, it would be my opinion that even simple situations like that, you just back away, go somewhere else, do, you know, just, you've got to remove yourself from it and, uh, and avoid the fight. That's why I say avoidance and awareness. So we're going to talk about that a lot more in situational awareness. And I, I think regardless of our level, here's what I found, Craig. And it was really interesting because my friend who helped to set up this, this basic firearms training, we looked at each other during this training and I said to him, brother, look around, who's here? And he looked around and he was like, pretty much everybody who could get by without this training. And isn't that the way it is? It's kind of like that. Like you run a marriage training, who shows up? 
maybe every once in a while you get somebody whose marriage is on the rocks. A lot of times it's people that know that they, they want to have a better marriage, right? Uh, same thing with training. Ego can get in the way and we can be delusional, very much delusional and think that because we've spent the last two or three years playing Call of Duty on our on our computers or our Xbox or whatever, whatever it is, that we know how to defend ourselves. And that is not the case. No. And, you know, I was actually pleasantly surprised. We had a recent training. It was a wilderness survival course. And we had, we had three people in a class that had never spent a night outside. Really? Never in their lives. That's encouraging. One, One young lady came, she flew in from New York city and she's a big, you know, what most people like me from rural Kentucky thinks of a person that lives in New York City. She was it. She dressed like it. She talked like it. The things that she did for recreation, you know, that's, you know, she was typical New Yorker. And, and, uh, it was funny because she got up the first morning. She said, you know, I usually put on nature sounds to sleep in the city. <laughs> and I heard all those sounds last night <laughs> here. And, uh, she said, so, cause I mean, one of the things that I do for people like that, and this seems simple, but I'll, I'll get to how this is self-defense oriented is one of the things that I do is, is one of the things that can scare somebody that's never spent a night outside are the sounds that you hear at night because you can't see what's going on. So I play things like owl sounds and I'll play what coyotes sound like and, and things of that nature so that people know, Hey, when they hear that in the middle of the night, it doesn't alarm them because they, cause I explain to them, yeah, you're going to hear coyotes. They're going to sound like this, but this is why they're doing that. And I explain to them why coyotes do what they do. Same thing is true with being situationally aware and prepared for self-defense is that the more, you know, this is why I would love it that we talked about the criminal mindset. We know how to look and see things that are happening that way. They don't alarm us. They just give us an opportunity to prepare for what could possibly happen. And we can talk about OODA loop. We can talk about color code of awareness. If you want to, any of these things that are going to help us do that, we've talked about those in podcast and that's in the tiny survival guide plug for that. We need to keep Gabe busy. So he's got stuff to do mailing those things out, but that is all there in the tiny survival guide. So pick that up and it, it'll detail some of the things that'll help you see situations for what they are setting your ego aside and being prepared so that you don't get surprised. All right, Craig and Gabe, I'm really excited to get into situational awareness and here's why Craig, you're going to land the plane. This is the money of this whole podcast right here, because more than carrying a gun, in my opinion, you correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, more than being a master in martial arts, more than almost anything else, situational awareness is our, and it's your, Number one, safety and self-defense tool because it is proactive and preventative in nature. Would you agree with that, Craig? Yeah, 100 percent. And I think as uh, I, I think there's two parts to discussing situational awareness. And the first part is to understand situational awareness at its root and then to also understand the obstacles to having good ob- uh, to having good situational awareness. You know, ob- the situational awareness is just being able to pay attention to your surroundings at all times. Um, some of the things that come up, there's particularly uh, color code of awareness, what is referred to as white, yellow, orange, and red color code of awareness. This was a method that's brought up by military strategists many years ago, and we've kind of co-opted it into the civilian mindset and law enforcement mindset as well. But basically your typical person walks around in code white, meaning they're not paying attention to anything that's going on around them at any given time. And code yellow is where somebody is paying attention to their surroundings, but they're not so paranoid about it. You look up, you look around, you, you are paying attention when people get in that five foot range, 25 foot range. Um, these are kind of things that you, you know, when people are there, but they're not threats, but you can see them as they're coming. Code orange is where you see a perceived threat. We'll get into the critical rule of threes here in a minute and, and how that comes about. And then code red is where you have an actual threat and you have to address it. And so what we want to do is encourage you as a listener to definitely not find yourself in code white. 
And, and again, when I discuss the obstacles, situational awareness, that's how you can avoid, avoid code white. But, but again, be in code yellow where you, your head's up, you're looking around. I call it the Navy SEAL stare when I have, uh, when I'm teaching self-defense, but basically where you're looking up and you're looking around, you're paying attention. You look people in the eye that deserve to have them looked in the eye. If you think somebody is a possible aggressor and you look their direction, uh, oftentimes this can be problematic because criminals want to be, uh, opportunistic and they want to get you by surprise. And so by looking them in the eye, then that might thwart what it is that they were trying to do. Um, you know, when it comes to where you go and the places that you find yourself in, like, let's say if you go to a restaurant, you go to church, you go to, to the, to the grocery store, you want to always be in a position where number one, Strangers can't sneak up on you and get uh, catch you by surprise. Number two, if something really bad happens, what's your exit strategy? You should know where you're going to go to get out of that building. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools for that. If you have something that can break a window, like a rescue me device or something of that nature, that way, if you can't find your way to a door, just find your way to a window and go through, you know, create a door. You take out the window and create a door. So, those are all things that are, in my opinion, and vital to situational awareness. Now, I mentioned the critical rule of threes, and, and basically what this means is, is you've got to be able to recognize anomalies as best you can so that you're aware of situations before they happen. Let me talk about people in particular. So if I, if I see somebody that is not doing what the crowd is doing, Humans are crowd animals. We're, we're herd animals. And so if the herd is doing something, we typically do what is happening around. As Gabe mentioned this earlier, he didn't call it the herd mentality, but he was referring to as we see these riots and these protests, people that are in the middle of it, that's what's surrounding them. So they kind of just do what they see the other people that are around them that are doing. Uh, humans as a species are like that. That's what we do. And so if you see somebody that is not doing what the herd is doing, number one, that warrants my attention. You know, it's the reason why when everybody gets onto an elevator, if somebody's facing the wrong direction, it just, it just, Hey, something's not right. Well, you should be able to find that person in every situation. If that person then has clothing on that could conceal a firearm, I'd start looking for bumps on the hip. I would look, be looking for an IFAC on the ankle or, you know, are, th are these people the type of people that are carrying a firearm that uh, can be concealed and do they have their hands where they can grab that firearm? You know, hands kill is what law enforcement officers say all the time. So you need to always be observing people's hands. And so if you notice two or three, and particularly as it relates to three, if you see a three anomalies, things that stand out, then do something that doesn't mean you go up and smack somebody in the face or shoot them. That just means that you probably need to move or you probably need to leave. And uh, when we get into the obstacles, I'll give you some hints on to help you with that as well. But this critical rule of three is, is literally critical to you paying attention and removing yourself when things that could possibly occur, occur before they happen. You know, Let me again, just back you up. Can you just maybe explain to our listeners uh, just specifically what the critical rule of threes is? In this case, it's just that when you recognize three anomalies, you do something. You know, the critical is it's it's a derivative of what I stole from the United States Marine Corps called the combat rule of three, which is if three things happen on the battlefield and they're out of the norm of a battlefield scenario, you've got to move and do something else because you're probably going to die. And so I just stole that idea from the Marine Corps. I mean, that's where I got it from a, a handout from the, for the United States Marines to apply it to us is that you literally see these things and then you remove yourself. So, you know, to give you an example in an urban setting, if you see a crowd that's forming, that's an anomaly because crowds don't typically form in places they're not supposed to form. And then you see that they're yelling and chanting. That's anomaly number two, because that doesn't happen. And now they're holding signs of, you know, people in places that, that have caused problems in, in our country in recent news. Then if I'm at a restaurant, then I'm leaving the restaurant, you all. I'm not going to be there anymore. 
I'm, I'm just going to leave. And so that is where I'm doing what I can to recognize these three anomalies. And that way I don't get caught in the middle of something. Now to take this a step further and then I'll shut up. So you all can talk for a while. Cause I've been talking too much, but this, so what we refer to as obstacles to situational awareness, we all have them. I have them. You have them. Everybody listening has them. And so there's three things that really keep us from having good situational awareness. The first is what we call not monitoring the baseline. So we should constantly be looking around us. And this is, this comes from man tracking mindset or an animal tracking mindset, constantly monitoring the environment in which we find ourselves, whether it's a rural environment or whether it's an urban environment and looking at it and go, okay, this is what this place looks like under normal circumstances. And when we do that, if something stands out, that's what we call disturbance. That's why we call it disturbance versus baseline. We want to recognize that if we see disturbance, it's not that we should absolutely right then do something. It's just that we should pay attention to it and see if it warrants more attention from from what it is that uh, we're doing at the time. And so most people will not monitor an environment that they are in at all. And there's reasons that we do that. The first is what we refer to as focus lock. And focus lock is getting worse and worse and worse every day that we go through life, mainly because we carry these little devices in our pockets that rob us of our attention. And we focus lock is where you get focused on a particular item or something that's going on in your own head, and you don't take any of the external information that's coming your direction. What I mean by that is that as it relates to phones is that you're you're somewhere out in general world, urban or rural, and you're on the phone and you're not actually seeing what's going on around you. I give you a case, uh, you know, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I do this. This happened to me and, and my wife today. We went out to the to the woods to make a video. We get on the on the back of the tailgate. and We're eating a snack before we get started. And we're talking about. We're talking about while we're eating and just having a conversation. We got a new puppy and all of a sudden we hear a a dog growl and bark at our puppy and just a feral dog had come into the area because she and I were focused on lunch. We weren't actually, we were letting the puppy just play. We didn't think there was any danger there. And then bam, there's this feral dog that's right by the truck. So that is where we allow danger to get into us a little bit too close than, than what we should have. Same thing is true in the middle of an urban situation. If you're not paying attention, you're focus locked on the conversation or you're focus locked on a phone, then you don't take in those externals and you have to. And then the third thing is what's referred to as normalcy bias. Normalcy bias is where we as a species, um, humans, tend to want to normalize all situations. And if we hear something, if we hear something like gunfire, it's firecrackers, right? We heard it, uh, another case in point last night, I was on a Zoom class and I heard something that sounded like a two bombs going off. And I'm not talking about fireworks. I'm talking about two bombs. It sounded huge. And so I immediately got off the class because I think it warranted my attention. It would be easy for me to say that was fireworks. It would be easy for me to say that's a car backfiring. And you should recognize those differences. Sure. But it was worthy of my attention to go, man, is somebody let off a bomb in in my neighborhood? And it, I mean, it was a big enough sound that my daughter heard it and she lives about 50 miles away. That's how loud it was. Oh, what was it? We don't know. And I tried to find it on the news. I, people have talked about it. Who heard that? What was it kind of thing? is the one thing I do like about Facebook. You get on Facebook and say, did anybody hear that? Yeah, I heard it. I don't know where it came from, but no, I don't know what it was. The point being is that when we see these situations and we see people because we don't like danger, particularly if we're not prepared for it, self-defense is a perfect example. If you're not prepared to defend yourself, if you're not prepare for surprise speed and violence of action. If you're not prepared to rip somebody's face off, that is trying to hurt you and those that you love, then you will normalize situations because you don't know how to fight. This is why I say that some of the nicest, most kind men in the world that I know are the ones that could literally tear you to shreds with their bare hands because they're just aware. They pay attention. They know when people are emotionally upset. They know when people are, are not in a place where they need to be and they address it before they 
before anything happens. And so, again, if you're not prepared for self-defense, you will normalize situations that should not be normalized. And that's a problem. If you do that, then you're not prepared at all. And you find yourself in a reactionary position rather than one where you're proactive. And it would be my recommendation. You avoid all these obstacles. Again, I'll summarize normalcy bias, focus lock, and not monitoring the baseline. Those are the three things that are obstacles, obstacles to good situational awareness. And then we can, we can take care of ourselves and be aware of what's going on around us. You know, and to go back to this dog, situation today as soon as i heard it i told jennifer my wife to pick up the dog and get in the truck and i left you know because it's my responsibility in that particular situation doesn't mean because i'm the man sometimes females do this as well males females but whoever is going to be responsible for that it's my responsibility to go eat alive or to handle the feral dog in that particular situation. And that way you have your roles. I have my roles. We know who's responsible for that. So once you see this threat, you need to address the threat. You don't want to normalize it. Um, what I'm trying to say there is, yeah, there's definitely a time to hide. We, we call it run, hide and fight, but there's also a time where you need to go address it and deal with it. And, uh, I, I don't know the number of the scripture. You can find it for me, Gabe, but, but one of the most, Uh, profound pieces of scripture for me is that when they came to take Jesus and Jesus knew he was going to be crucified, Jesus went out. He stood up and he went out. He didn't hide from anybody. He went and dealt with the situation knowing that he's going to die. That's that. That's, that's pretty cool stuff. I'll put it that way. Yeah. uh, I think the big thing is let's, let's avoid these obstacles. You know, the normalcy bias, not monitoring baseline and focus lock. Those are the three biggies. Uh, If you do those things, Here's what I tell, because I train a lot of active aggressive training for churches. If you do those things, like say in a church, for example, or you do it in your work life or, or home life or whatever, you actually just do a better job at what you're supposed to be doing. You know, and like, for example, you know, if there's a church greeting committee, I just I like using churches because churches oftentimes are very big victims of normalcy bias. And so when I go into a church and try to teach active aggressive training, They want to normalize and make everybody okay because they love on people and all that good stuff. And I love that about church life. I do. I I love that. But we need to be more proactive, I think. And one of the ways you can do that is to every time somebody walks in the building, for example, go meet them and address them and make sure they feel welcome. Because that's just good church. And it's also good situational awareness. You know, if somebody stands out, then you can immediately go over there and find out if, oh, they're just having a bad day or something actually is up and we need to warrant more attention in that direction. Same thing with any place that we find ourselves. So I kind of got off on a tangent there, but that's, that's important. And then the big thing is have your head on a swivel up, looking around, pay attention to what's going on around you at all times, have exit strategies ready uh, at, at all times, no matter where you are, you need to have an exit strategy. Um, her, Again, humans are herd animals. This is what happened in Las Vegas. Everybody herded right to a certain exit strategy because when 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 we're caught in a position where we're not ready to exit, then we just go to where we've known there is no danger, which is the place that we came in on. If the shooter in Las Vegas had wanted to kill dozens and dozens of people, all he would have had to do, and he could have done this and he chose not to, is put his rifle on that funnel and just shot people as they were coming through that funnel because they all had to go out the same way they came in. And so, you know, for me, if I go into an area and there's only one entrance, as soon as I get in there, I'm looking for another exit because if there's only one entrance, like a restaurant, for example, I'm immediately looking for exit strategies that are not the entrance because if bad things happen in that restaurant, everybody's going to go to that entrance to get out. And if, if there's somebody that has any sense whatsoever, they're going to be there at that funnel. And so I want to avoid that funnel. So I'll say this as I head us out of here, you all, uh, just as you listen in, you may want to listen to some parts of this again, take some notes from time to time and write some of these things down. I know for those of you that are listening and you're driving home from work or driving to work or, or some of that nature, then you might have to do that at a different time, but do what you can to commit these things to memory so that you can, 
uh, utilize them to help yourself helping those that you care about. Don't forget everybody that's uh, not subscribed to the YouTube channel and not subscribed to the podcast. And please do. I, I can't explain to you how important it is that those things are done and it's free. It doesn't cost you a dime to do that. Um, so give us a thumbs up on the video on YouTube and always wherever you find us, give us a five-star review. If it's on Apple podcasts or Google play or Spotify or wherever it might be. And if you've heard something today, you thought sounded really cool and you think somebody could benefit from it, share it with them, hit the little share button, wherever you're listening and share it over with those that you care about. Don't forget to check us out. Check me out at naturereliance.org. That's my website. Check David Gabe and everything they're doing at ultimate survival tips and tiny survival.com for the tiny survival guide. These are important places to go to support what it is that we're doing. Listen, we can't do it without your support. You all. So thank you for the support from everyone who's already done that. We can't thank you enough. And we look forward to doing everything we can to support you and help you with the knowledge that we can help you with mindset, skills, tactics, and gear. So I think that's it as always keep it simple be positive and stay sharp. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. And if you like what we're doing here at Ultimate Survival Tips, we've got a full lineup of new MSK1 survival knives and everyday carry gear that I designed over at ultimatesurvivaltips.com. Okay, this is David. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you on the other side. And remember, be prepared because you never know.